Kid, seriously. Welcome to the triumphant return of the Star Wars In Review podcast. We're the only podcast to be evil from Anakin's point of view. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, who did not actually see The Phantom Menace with me in the theater, despite my continual misremembering that he did. Who am I? I'm Maya Madrid, who saw that movie with a kid, kid seriously, who doesn't even like Star Wars. Every so often, we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars, answer some questions that kids seriously got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series, Luke Neitzel. Well, we didn't even actually know each other. Well, we had met we had one met weekend, you. but I was so drunk that weekend that I did not remember you. That's true. So, got you confused with someone else when I met you then three months later? That's true. <laughs> Props to Max out there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it was but Max, right? It was like, Max. Okay. Yeah, no, it was Nate Walsh. <laughs> I wish it was Nate Walsh. <laughs> or Jay Ford. One of the two. I got you confused with. But... No, I saw that in the uh, theater with my friend Scott. Oh, excellent. Mm-hmm. So what's going on with you this week? How are things? Tell us what you Well, like. I had a magical weekend. Oh, it was magical. Tell it was, me about it. It was magical. I spent it, I spent it in a hotel room with Jim. Whoa! So it was, it was something. We, we was took... it a hotel room for two? Uh, well, it, it, it was one hotel room with two bedrooms. Okay. So, But we, we went to the Dells with our, uh, our, our... We had to bring our kids and wives, apparently. Oh, well, that's... Or whatever. But that was that You know, was there are little fun. drawbacks to fun times. You know, and everything... It, be exactly. But kids and wives, they eventually fall asleep and... Then you can you can play board games the rest of the night. Where'd you guys go? Drunk. Uh, Kalahari. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it was a good time. The deal for me, it is all LeBron. I am on pins and needles trying to figure out where LeBron James goes. I know you're not a big NBA guy, but I am. And we have an outside chance. I say we, my team is the Los Angeles Lakers, stemming from when I grew up in um, for four years, four, five years, excuse me, out in California. Um, I've liked him a lot. I think he's the third best player to ever step on the floor. Uh, of any NBA game, and the idea that he might come to the team that I like is super exciting. I haven't been this exciting since we got Shaquille O'Neal, um, so I'm hoping that it comes through. Additionally, Paul George, uh, who's a great player, he's from Palmdale, the town that I used to live in, he's also rumored to be uh, perhaps coming. Um, they're talking about trading for Kawhi Leonard, and those are three of the best players in the league, and even today, LeBron was allegedly texting Kevin Durant to try to see if he'd be willing to get out of his contract with Golden State to come to LA. Holy crap, if we get two out of those guys, like I would be weeping tears of joy. I'd be so excited. So, um, pins and needles for me, just hoping that it works out. I don't I don't care much about the NBA, but I did once have a Tom Googly out of Jersey, so if, if that counts for anything. <laughs> it does count for anything. All right. Um... I just love the idea that uh, Wink Martindale and I could be on opposite ends and have, Le- you know, he, he doesn't seem to care for LeBron, judging by his tweets. So, uh, Golden State versus LA, LeBron versus Steph Curry and the boys, I think it'd be really fun. I don't think he dislikes it. I think he just likes being able to say snide things on the internet. Yeah. And that was an easy avenue since he lives in the city where a team is doing very, very well. I like an alternate reality where we pit him, two people who really care about the NBA, even though he doesn't, no. on opposite <laughs> ends of a rivalry. I think like that's just the making of something really special. So Sure. Well, sure. I'll, I'll go buy some Clippers gear or something if it makes you <laughs> feel better. <laughs> it would. It would. I don't know if it would make you feel better. Let's get to the news! All right, Luke, at the 44, 44th annual Saturn Awards for science fiction, horrors, and horror, and thrillers, Star Wars The Last Jedi picked up two more awards in its impressive hall, including Mark Hamill for Best Actor and to Ryan Johnson for Writing. These awards are given out separately to each of the genres, but in the writing care category, science fiction, horror, thrillers, and comic book movies are all thrown into one, um, which is, what I wrote here, which is a better brew than Big Al's KC barbecue sauce. So Johnson beats out writers from Black Panther, which is included Ryan Coogler, uh, Blade Runner, Get Out, Logan, Shape of Water, and Wonder Woman. Luke, I think you've liked all of those films and seen all those films, if I'm not mistaken. Um... And this award seems like geared towards the movies that we really like. And I wanted to get your opinion on where Last Jedi, from a writing standpoint, fits in with those films. What you liked more, what maybe you liked less. um, And get your ideas on, uh, if you were voting for the award, who you would have voted for. I I would have voted for Get Out. I think that was the best movie that came out last year. I think it was the the best written movie, and it won an Oscar for that, which was really exciting as well. So that's what I would have picked. I don't know how the Saturn Awards are actually chosen. Is that a a fan thing? Is that, is there some type of guild? 
or something that's involved in that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how they're picked. I I like the Last Jedi a lot, so I I'm not upset. But as you said, I liked all of these movies, um, and for all the the crap Ryan Johnson has endured, I think that it's nice he gets that type of recognition. But I also don't think the Saturn Awards are a, a huge deal in the grand scheme of things. I mean. What, I mean, the Academy Awards obviously are, and a lot of them want them, but, you know, it's an award for art. It's all subjective, but it's a flock of really good movies to pick from, and I probably would have been happy with most any of them getting picked, but Get Out's the one I would have gone with first. Now, I've only seen Black Panther, Logan, and Wonder Woman on this particular list, and Black Panther and Logan are two of my favorite movies of all time, so that's not fair. fair. I talked to you in the past, I didn't like Wonder Woman, I... Um, for reasons I, I really like Captain America the Winter Soldier and I thought it, or I'm sorry Captain America the first Avenger thought it was too similar so that's where it rank it ranked number three out of those four for me but what I think is really valuable about this wars and this award and for Star Wars as a franchise um, is having these positive news um, things coming into this year and a half that we're going to have without films it's been kind of a dark time between solo and all of the drama with like fans being crabby on twitter that it's good to have some good news out there um i know that you think that um having the, ch- the franchise have a chance to breathe a little bit in the year and a half is a good thing for the franchise but selfishly selfishly i don't want that and i think um having good news and keeping star wars like in the news makes me excited um, and probably people like me excited, and I don't want it to go away. Well, I, th- I, I think you're misinterpreting what I'm saying there. I may be. Because... That wouldn't be the first time it's happened. <laughs> I, I'm okay with the movies being spaced out, because the anticipation for the movies is what builds, but it's the little nuggets of things about the movies and, and the build-up that helps make that anticipation better, mm-hmm. um, which for me is something that was lacking in Solo. You, you know, there was so much build-up for The Last Jedi, and I really liked that, that by the time I was done processing Last Jedi and having massive debates with you about it and whatnot, I didn't have the same amount of time to get into Solo and to get the things built up. Now, granted, it was also a premise I wasn't jumping to have happen. Right. But th- these are the type of things I do like, and I think, as you said, it helps build steam and helps build momentum and get people really excited for a movie where if it was coming out in July or August... It's it, you're not nearly going to have that I can't wait to get in the theater feeling that you get when you have to wait a year and if you remember back to the prequels what did we have to wait three years in between was movies was it two years in between the first two and three years between the last it was, or was it, it was 99 and then 2002 yeah, you're right. and then I believe 2005 that sounds right so it it I know the first two I know that for a fact because I know based on who I went with but <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know, that type of build-up, man, you could not wait for those things to come out. And I think that really masked a lot of how much people didn't like them at the time, is that you were just so starved for something yeah. that you ended up liking it. and make... I know I made a lot more excuses for those movies, especially Phantom Menace, just because it was something Star Wars. It was the first new Star Wars movie I ever saw in the theater. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw the re-releases of the original, but I'd seen them on VHS four million times before then. So... I, I think I think this type of thing is a good thing. Any 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 news that keeps them in the spotlight is is good for them and what they want. And it's a and I kind of said this before. Anything positive because there's been so much negativity lately. Yeah. That it's like, all right, like Last Jedi, not like Last Jedi. It was a huge, massive, you know, box office success and respected on all these awards that it's gotten from all these different agencies. So, you well, know, and and no matter what your take on the Last Jedi is, is nobody wants to read articles about people being vulgar and racial to Kelly Marie Tran. Right. Like, that's not that's not news we want. Ever. Right. So. so, there's a problem this week, Luke. Oh, no. There are too many news stories that I wanted to ask you about. Oh, my gosh, and I actually have one, too, that you might not have. Really? Yeah. So, uh, we'll get to that after, uh, okay. because it's my call and I'm going first. Sure. Because I'm a dick like that. And so, I have created a new segment... Ooh. And that segment, um, rather than stand firm and keep this, this two or three stories like we normally do, I'm introducing to you our newest David Byrne style segment called Am I Right or Am I Wrong? And this is where I rapid fire ask you questions about the news from last week and give have you give us an abbreviated take. This is in honor, of co- course, for all the people on Twitter who love to tell each other how wrong they are. Perfect. Are you ready? Let's let's do it. Story number one. Luke, Ron Howard has asked us all to cool our jets about the rumors of Star Wars anthology movies getting the axe 
telling us that it is not entirely correct. This seems to coincide with many of the new rumors coming out of Disney that seem to be saying that our friend Frosty might have jumped, jumped the gun a little bit from last week. Luke, how long until we see the next anthology film? Uh, year and a half. Year and a half to two years, I think they'll announce um, Obi-Wan relatively soon, and that'll be the next one that we'll see. Excellent. You are right. I have written here, it will be no more than five years until we see the next anthology film. So, excellent. You are one for one. Woo! Good work there. Number two. News out of Ryan Johnson's camp says that this next sequel series may be ready to kick off in as little as two years. It could be done within two years. Would you be ready for another Johnson film only one year after episode nine? Yes, as long as there's nothing in between. Excellent. You are right again. Two for two. Movies are good for brand. Give me those clicks. It's good for our brand, and it's good for Star Wars, and it makes me happy because I want more Star Wars. Excellent. Two for two. You're doing really good at this, man. So proud. Uh, Number three. CNET has published an article about the color of lightsabers that meant one thing during Legends, and then that kind of changed um, during the Clone Wars when they got into the Kyber Crystals, things like that. Luke Neitzel, if you had to pick a lightsaber color, which color is the best color? Rainbow. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. I also had that the best color is the original color, which is white, because it's be a shout-out to Ralph McQuarrie's original drawings. It's also Ahsoka's later on... Can I just say, yeah. I was about to actually tweet, which I never do, when I saw that headline article, and I was just going to write, red means bad, above the article, <laughs> but I figured there was probably already a billion people that had done that. Probably. But, but I like your answer, nonetheless. For me, it's white. I also I also like purple. Of course purple. you like white. Oh, God. <laughs> Are you saying I like white just because I didn't like let's, the last shot? Let's move on. Oh, God. <laughs> it's not true. I just didn't like it. Too many women talking. No, that's not why. (laughs) Okay, number four. Are you three for three? All right. Amy Hennig, I think that's how you pronounce her name. She was hired to do an EA video game for the Star Wars universe after the successful games of Battlefront and Battlefront 2. Throwing into question, she's just been fired. Throwing into question whether or not we'll see a game like this at all. Luke, what is your opinion on the firing of Amy Hennig? I don't care. You're wrong, okay? (laughs) I don't have the Battlefronts, but I would totally purchase a game about the seedy underbelly of the Star Wars universe, especially by the lady who directed Uncharted, which I hear is really good. More video games are good for brand. Stay on brand. Okay, that's three for one. It's still not bad. That's 75%. I'm not not 10, so I don't need a video game. (laughs) Dude, you just pissed off our entire audience. You are a jerk. (laughs) Both of them. Uh, Number five. Tabloid and right-wing websites like Breitbart are pushing a narrative that Bob Iger has already made the decision to fire Kathleen Kennedy and is having trouble finding a replacement with J.J. Abrams and Kevin Feige both turning the job down. Luke, on a scale of 0 to 0, how much credit do you give this rumor? Minus 12. Excellent. Uh, You were right. I'm supposed to believe that the most successful producer of all time is going to get fired because Breitbart told me so? Seriously? Forget that. Number six, you're on fire here. Good job, buddy. Benicio Del Toro wants more Sicario movies and more Star Wars movies. My question to you is, do you want more DJ in your Star Wars movie? No, that's a big no. Really? You're wrong. As long as they get rid of that stutter, I want more (laughs) DJ. All right, number, so you are four for two, right? So you're going to be above 500. This is, or you'll be at least 500, because we got eight. Number seven. Luke, disgruntled fans of the Star Wars franchise have declared an open rebellion against Disney. Will this have any effect on the bottom line of Episode Nine? No. no. <laughs> Wrong. No. It will have effect, but it'll be the reverse effect, <laughs> leading to more people to go to the movie. Right now it's 600, so 600 people that got a ton of press, and that's going to cause more people to go to it than the 600 people who are not. Number eight, so you're, what's it, four and two, three? Four and now? three. Oh, God. All right. For the win. Comic-Con has announced that they are doing a presentation for the 10-year anniversary of the uh, Clone Wars series. Is this credit where credit is due, or is it an attempt to stay relevant with nothing new to show? What say you? I think it's credit where credit's due. It's a good show, and it had a really long run. Absolutely. Stay on brand. All news (laughs) is good news, especially when it benefits us. This is great. Congratulations, Luke. You are 5 for 3. You are a big winner today. So that was our rapid fire segment, and we at Kids Seriously always remind you to know right from wrong and to like what you like. Let's move to the mailbag. 
Well, hold on. I want to ask you mine oh, first. Oh, oh, because, oh, sorry, sorry. And my, mine's actually kind of a, a trivia question, too, because IMDb put out a list of the 50 highest grossing actor and actresses of all time. So they're cumulative movies, but they took out cameos. So um, Samuel L. Jackson, spoiler alert, doesn't get to count the revenue from Infinity War because okay. it's just a cameo. But they, there are two Star Wars actors who are in the top ten all time. Wow. One is very obvious, Look, and now, now I'm gonna one I will be shocked it. if you can get. So, so who are your guests at which which two actors? Is it real dollars, or do you have any idea? If it's it's real it's, dollars? it's it's domestic, non adjusted for inflation, total box office. Okay, so it's it's the newer films, I think. <sighs> oh man, one of these should be just hitting you in the face. He's the one of them. Harrison is, Ford, exactly, is number two overall behind Samuel L. Jackson. Okay, and then somebody else that you'd be surprised if I got. Kira Knightley. No. Okay, because she's in that was a good guy. I mean, she's in the Pirates movies, right. which there's a lot of Pirates actors that are in. And I really like the first Pirates movie. And I, I really like her I'll, and Orlando Bloom and Johnny Depp. Like I, I'll give, I I'll give you it. I'll give you a hint. Okay, if you could name. A non-Star Wars property that this person is in, I would be shocked. Okay. You may have to cut this out because I really want to think a long time. Okay. It's going to be a lot of dead air, so you can play like some sort of music. The Waiting by Tom Petty. That would be great. Oh my god, it's Liam Neeson with the Taken series. No. (laughs) You want me to see Keep Guessing? No, no. Well, if you want to take another, I'll I'll let you. You like that shot from the hip? That That was. was, But I feel like you're not taking advantage of my clue, because I think you can name another Liam Neeson movie. Oh, you meant... I'm saying that if you you could name... No, if you could name anything that this person did that wasn't Star Wars related, I'd be impressed. Anthony Daniels. What? He is the only actor, basically, because Kenny Baker passed away before the new ones. But Anthony Daniels is in, um, would get credit for every, every Star, Star Wars, Wars movie, movie except Solo. Yeah. But which that's is what's interesting about this. Which is nine, but but how many of those movies are over a You're billion right, dollars? Right, 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 right. But what else is he in? Is he in anything else? I, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he okay. has other credits, okay. but I didn't go look him up. But yeah, he yeah. was number eight. Overall, for the wow. whose movies have made highest grossing, but it's purely because he's the only actor who's in every single Star Wars movie for the most part. Yeah, that really shows you how you know powerful the brand is when you think about it over the long term. Um, wow, I, which, I would never. Which, have in, that. in comparison, Mark Hamill was like in the '40s, and most of his is basically going to be off Star Wars as well. But mm-hmm. he's he doesn't he get credit for Force Awakens because that's a cameo. Right. So he's got the the first three, and then he's got Last Jedi. Last Jedi, and then you know. I'd be interested to see what that list was with real dollars, because oh, the first yeah. one's such a smash hit. How that? I mean, well, and Anthony Daniels was in that, but with Mark Hamill, I wonder if that, where that would put him from the fortieth. Yeah. Anyways. But but then you're just gonna you're just gonna have everyone from Gone with the Wind. will be yeah, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. They're just well, dominating. The entire all the cast time, right? is the first fifty. So all right, hey guys, uh, if you're out there and you want to contact the show, we would love to hear what you have to say. We can be reached at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail dot com, or you can send us a message at kidsseriously at Luke underscore Neitzel or at Maya Madrid and fire off a question for everyone's favorite segment. Email that kid seriously got. And by the way, it doesn't actually have to be an email. Luke, Boom Madrid asks, do you think the young Luke is better or the old Luke is better? I think the young. What say you? Well, it's uh, it's hard because it's you're defining better. Right. In which way, I mean... She's eight, so she's... She's eight, so I 100% understand where she is coming from. And uh, and can see see why she would pick that. I think most people would pick that. I think Last Jedi Luke is more interesting because there's just a lot more depth to what's happening to him and and the the journey he's taking. I think is a little more complex than any journey that any George Lucas written character has ever taken. So 
I, I will, I mean, th this isn't to knock on any version of Luke, but I, I'll, I'll say that maybe I enjoy the journey a little bit more of The Last Jedi. Luke. Last Jedi, so the older Luke. For me, I don't think it's a sur surprise. I like the younger Luke. That was, you know, my guy growing up, uh, him and Han Solo, and I kind of would alternate between those. Um, that was my preference, but I like what you like. Hey, Lady Madrid asks, you can see where I got my questions this week, mm -hmm. what classic, ro like, assuming that you had to replace the original Star Wars theme, the original music, with classic rock music, like Flash Gordon style, what song or songs would you pick for this soundtrack? Uh, so to start out, opening crawl music, I would take uh, Army of Me by Bjork. Okay. Because that has like a really cool, it'd be a really good wrestling theme too, because it's got a, like a really stunning kind of start to it, and then it's kind of weird and trippy and would look good in space okay so awesome. I, I'm, I'm gonna take that one off the top of my head excellent for me tomorrow never knows by the beatles or don't fear the reaper by blue oyster cult well, that'd, that'd be, be pretty good awesome darth <laughs> vader music all right guys uh let's move on to our review of the clone wars we got season one episode 20 we are almost getting done with the first season uh this episode is called innocence of ryloth the cost of war can never be truly accounted for Remember that, America. Written by Ryan Stradley and Henry Gilroy, this episode is directed by Justin Ridge, and the story does a deep dive onto the planet of Ryloth, now that Windu and Kenobi have arrived with their invasion forces after Anakin was able to bust the blockade in the last episode. Take it away, Luke Neitzel. So in our last episode of the series, they couldn't land the ground forces, so they had to send Ahsoka and Anakin in to clear the blockade. In this episode, they're in the atmosphere, but they need to be able to clear a space where they can land all of their their big cruisers. So this time they send Obi-Wan and some of his clones down to the surface while most of the cruisers kind of stay in atmosphere because they are being pummeled by these pulse cannons. The proton troopers. Pro yeah. yeah, that are shooting at them. And they have a droid leader down there who has uh, taken all the, the Twi'leks, who are the people of Ryloth, who are familiar because they are the race of the dancing woman in Jabba's palace that gets eaten by the Rancor in Return of the Jedi. But they have taken the people from this village and are basically using them as human shields around the cannons because they know if those people are there that the Republic won't just bomb the cannons and destroy them. It's pretty good planning, actually, for the, for the droids. So what Obi-Wan and his team do is they land... And we, uh, we meet a couple new clones, Waxer and Boyle, who we immediately get nervous for because yes. they got names. I thought about that last week from last week's episode when you, when you talked about, like, great, these guys are going to die. And this is a three-parter, so yeah. I mean, like, but there's a lot of... Other than opening the door, we don't really get any returning characters from the last episode. Uh, the, 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 the Trade Federation leader from the last episode, he's gone. We don't get any similar forces you know, the Anakin, we don't know what Anakin and Ahsoka are doing. I don't know if they're just sitting in atmosphere try, or sitting in um, orbit trying to protect the planet from the outside. But we didn't get really get any holdover characters other than Obi-Wan made an appearance last time. But they, they land down there and we have a couple good battle sequences to open. Yeah. Uh, there is kind of a, a, cather, a canyon type structure that the droids are in and, and they get in a fight with with Obi-Wan and his troops who are kind of in a tree line. And there was a nice little move where Obi-Wan has uh, e EMP grenades, which he the, the clones try to throw them and they can't get them distance-wise. So Obi-Wan just uses the Force and moves them over to the droids. Now there's one part that was said early on, I, I believe it was for, before this happened, and I'm surprised that you didn't mention it. I winced at the mention of one of the clones telling the other clones that these people were tailheads. And it was sort of like a racial slur. Oh, I missed that. It was a racial slur about the Twi'leks that kind of surprised me. And I winced and I was like, oh God, they need to sort of face up and, and man up on this. And they do later in the episode, yeah. uh, which makes me like it. So but... is that Waxer? Or was it another yeah, name? Yeah, I can't I remember. I... Okay. Boyle and... It's, 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 Waxer it wouldn't be Boyle. Boyle, I would guess. It's Waxer. Boyle then. is the one that, that's, yeah. that's more... Okay. Yeah. So... Well, I completely missed I was that. really worried, but I'm wow. happy to say that they come through later in it, which made me really happy. It turned a net negative into a net win. But that dropping of a racial slur 
really comes back at the end of the episode, and I think it does a great job with that. I also want to mention that the troop carriers, I think, are poorly designed. You just don't get enough troops for a real invasion in those gigantic troop carriers, and then you have this little space for, like, six dudes. It seems like <laughs> we'll go real waste of, of space. And then one other thing, the pro droid crawling. I'd never seen that before, and maybe I oh. missed it before. I thought that was a, a little cool uh, thing that they threw in. Yeah, yeah, that was cool, because the, uh, the droids have the Imperial probe droids we've seen from Empire, and they use those to try and spy and gather information from the Republic troops. Now, the Republic troops want to figure out what exactly is going on at the droid base, so they don't have they don't have their own Imperial probe droid to send out, so they send Waxer and Boyle, our, our little tag team out there, to go through and find out what's happening. And they go through the city, which has basically been abandoned, because all the people have been rounded up and taken into the cannon area so they can protect the cannons and they're going through this village they think it's a little a little creepy and a probe droid goes past them and ends up spying on anakin and is basically or on obi-wan and is basically able to broadcast obi-wan's entire battle plan back to his commander because obi-wan's not really taking any precautions when he talks to mace windu and they realize it's it's obi-wan so they download all their files that they have on obi-wan and his battle strategy and they are uh, making their countermeasures on how they can get rid of the Republic. Meanwhile, Boyle and Waxer stumble upon a little Twilight girl who has been hiding in the rubble. And Boyle is very, very concerned about her and w- doesn't want to leave her. And Waxer's kind of like, we can't do anything about it. Just leave her and we'll, we got to complete our mission type deal. But the, the girl starts to cry and they, they get nervous for her. And then she they, they try to send her off and she kind of follows him and... Then they kind of decide that they are going to take care of her and make sure that nothing happens to her. Boyle really wants this while Waxer kind of reluctantly decides to do it. And uh, she has a word, what is it, Nesser or something like that, that she keeps saying to them because she speaks in a language they don't understand. But she keeps saying one word uh, repeatedly over and over. Now the droids, oh it's Nira, that was the word. Nira, Nira is what she keeps calling them, but we don't know what that means. Uh, the droids, we find out, have these weird dinosaur insect things that they that they just call it. They don't even have names either. They just call them creatures, basically, that they have locked up and they've been starving. And I, I kind of like this villain because he's like, oh, I'm going to test a theory on these. So he throws a droid in there and it chomps on the droid and then spits it out. And he's like, just like I thought, they need organic flesh to eat. Uh, and the droids kind of have some, some dumb moments in there. But basically what they are going to do is just release these things to go soften up the, the clones. And then they can go and, you know, finish them off because right. they'll be wounded. Because he, he's got like eight or ten of them. And they're basically almost completely repellent to laser blasts for whatever reason. They seem to have no effect on them. So he releases those to go out there. And they encounter Boyle and Waxer and the little girl. And the little girl is actually in her house. She's taken them to their house, which has been bombed out, and no one knows where her parents are and stuff, and she kind of cries in there. And then these dogs attack, and she's able to take them into some tunnels that run underneath the entire city that she is very familiar with. This is one of the reasons that I like this episode. It's a big story, and it's a small story. And I like stories that are that we see sort of a slice of life or something important happen, a little small story within the larger war that's going on and the battle that's going on. I love the way that this episode was set up. Um, and... You know, it reminds me of the Iraq War, which is really important and going on at the time that this was written. Um, if you look at it, I think this is sort of the writer's extent. I don't know how many um, stories you heard about, you know, in the Iraq War with the treatment of Iraqi people um, by U.S. soldiers, but that is often a very tenuous situation. And this episode is almost specifically, I think, pointing to that. Um, and so I, I really. I really thought that was well done. Yeah, no, it it is. It's a human story, and we don't get a lot of human stories up to this point, but this is one that anyone can identify with, even though it's dealing with the fantastical. So, no, this this was very well done. Now, meanwhile, Obi-Wan is getting concerned about where Waxer and Boyle are, because they haven't gotten a report, so he takes some clones out to go try and find them. Even though before, he didn't care too craps earlier this season no uh, and he normally them. does but these two have names so right. we care we care about that well he cares about their intelligence too that they're supposed to be gathering so they go out there to find them and they get attacked by the dogs uh and have an interesting battle sequence this is where we find out that laser blasts seem to have no effect on them and obi-wan i'm not sure if if he was using a mind trick or if he was force pulling them 
but he gets all the dogs basically into this cavern and then has the clone troops shoot the the rocks around it to kind of collapse it in and then he's able to kind of super leap his way out of it i'm not sure if it entirely made sense but it was an interesting way rather than shooting things there's a, there's a thing in legends and there's a thing in um the broader star wars universe about obi-wan and animals okay and so it's it was a mind trick where he was basically mind you know trying to protect them from from hurting themselves or like when in a new hope when he makes like the crate dragon noise to scare off like the the sand people sure there's some sort of obi-wan with animals thing that has gone on in legends that okay. i thought that was a shout out too so i really enjoyed well that. and at like, this oh, time uh, legends could have been canon depending right. on what it was so so yeah so he he does that and that's how they escape him and the, or uh, they escape from them and we don't see those anymore, which was kind of unfortunate, because they, they built them up a little bit, but the sequence with them actually doing something is relatively short. But they end up then having Waxer, Boyle, and the little girl come out of the tunnel area, and their Waxer's a little worried they're going to get in trouble because they deviated from their mission to save the little girl, but uh, it's not a clone, so Obi-Wan really wants to help the little girl. And uh, <laughs> they decide to take her with because she can lead them basically through the tunnels, to come up behind the droid so they can hopefully free all the Twi'leks. Meanwhile, uh, it must be Commander Cody, because he's the one always with Obi-Wan, is going to attack from the front as more of a diversion. And that's what takes us into our final battle, is Cody attacks from the front. The droids think that that's all the forces that are coming for them. So they move everybody to the front, and then Obi-Wan is able to free all the Twi'leks, and his clones are able to attack from, from behind to take out a lot of the droids what we end up ha what ends up culminating is the droid leader has a tank basically on obi-wan and is going to be able to kill him and the twi'lek see that and kind of stand up for themselves and end up rushing this tank and and beating him down to end the day so not surprisingly the good guys win mace windu also flies in exactly at that moment so i'm not sure what well i suppose he was waiting for those cannons to come down mm -hmm. but it they, could be setting up for the final episode. Of well, well, it is. Yeah. But I was like, you couldn't have helped them earlier if you right. could have flown in there. But I suppose they were waiting for the cannons to be taken out, which they were at that point because Obi-Wan basically jumped in a cannon and shot all the other ones with that to eliminate them all. And so then we, we finish basically the battle sequence portion of it, and then we just have a little bit of wrap-up with... Uh, wha well, first off, just as you said, Mace Windu talking about now we just have a foothold. Now we have to take the capital, which I'm assuming our next episode is going to be about taking the capital. But then we get the the real culmination of the episode, which is uh, the little girl finds her dad, which which is a nice little moment. And uh, Waxer and Boyle go to say goodbye to her, and they're all kind of emotional. And uh, she says the word again a bunch, near and nearer. And they ask Obi-Wan, because he can speak the language, what she's been saying to them, and she's been calling them brother the entire time and uh we all learned a lesson and then uh we fade to credits getting ready to go attack the capital this was a very good episode there's one part that i want to bring up that that you didn't mention here and it was after they got the emir that robot that was in in the charge the slaves or the slaves the prisoners i should say take over they throw him on the ground and they start pulling out his parts and ripping off his head yeah. which i was like holy shit it was awesome, but it was also like extremely graphic of this person yeah. who had been oppressing them and starving them, and then they're liberated. And again, it reminded me of the Iraq War, whether you're talking about tearing down the Saddam Hussein statue, or when he was caught, or when his sons were killed, and that same sort of thing. So again, I think this is kind of like a like a like a commentary on the Iraq War. Uh, I really liked it too. What were you going to say as far as? No, you know, I, I think we we've touched on a lot of the things I liked that. The fact that this was a, a, a large battle, but we were looking at a very small human story is what really jumps out at me. It's, and, and with characters that were 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 vulnerable, with characters, I, I was sure one of Waxer Boyle was going to die in the course of this episode, and they, they didn't. So I kind of liked that I didn't, know, you know, with, with Obi-Wan and Anakin, you, you know, and Ahsoka, you, you know they're going to live because we see them in other things after that. So it was kind of nice to have with that. Clones, you expect they're going to die. Yeah, exactly. So this is not a exactly. So I, I really didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, there were some really nice little details just in the character designs. Boyle has uh, tally marks carved into his yeah. helmet, and uh, Waxer. Has like a, like a little... I didn't know if it was a logo or if it was supposed to be damage or if he painted his helmet, but he has some type of black spot on the side right. of his helmet, which I wasn't entirely sure. But you could tell they they put they took some time. 
Because a lot of the times, the way they differentiate these clones is one's bald, one has a mohawk, and one has full hair. And mm. that's what they, they just kind of do that in sporadic patterns. We're here it actually kind of felt like they thought about who these characters were and tried to make designs that would fit into them. And it also throws back to uh, one of the first episodes that we saw where they had you know, a star, uh, a starship where they had painted a, a woman on it a la mm-hmm. World War Two, who I think was actually Rookies. a Twi'lek, right. too. Was it? Yeah. I think it was right. a blue Twi'lek they had painted on there. And they had the, the radio, the military radio they were listening to, which made us both think of Vietnam. And that's, you know, what you kind of saw in this is they kind of, they took more of a, a, they took more of a specific design to these characters rather than just kind of painting with broad brushes. And I picked up on that and I liked it. Yeah, for me, too, one thing we didn't mention was the music. I thought the music was really well, well done. The visuals, for me, this was kind of an average episode. I'd say it's good enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but the music, I think, really stood out as being really well done uh, for that. How many pews are you going to give this, man? All four. All four? Yeah. Yeah, for me, well, yeah. ranked number three out of okay. 20. I had trouble putting it past Rookies and Trespass. I love those two episodes so much. It, I, 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 For a while, I thought it was it was two for a while, I thought it was one. It's right in there in that conversation. At the end of the day, I didn't put it up there, but uh, ask me tomorrow, it could be number one. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's a good one, and it's one you would want to watch again or revisit, which I don't think you can say about a ton of these. I think there's probably four or five total. Uh, and what are we? What are we on? Like eighteen or nineteen? We're on twenty. Twenty. Yeah. Okay, so we're on we're on twenty, and you know I'm probably looking at four or five that I ones I consider rewatchable. But as far as a cartoon or as far as a Star Wars a Star Wars cartoon, I mean that's pretty that's a pretty high batting average. I'm, well, I'm meaning that in in big praise of this episode yeah. basically is what I'm what I'm trying to say. Like I, I think it's one that will continue to hold up. It it had substance to it. It wasn't just flash. Like there's episodes you watch and you enjoy them and you go that's really cool, but there's nothing behind it. So once the surprise of it is or the over. Visual is over. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, being a big horror movie fan, there are different types of horror movies. There are horror movies that you see the first time because you don't know what's going to happen, and they're awesome. And then the second time you watch them, there's nothing to them, mm-hmm. and you so you can't ever rewatch them. And then there's other ones that are like Get Out is a good example. That's about so much more than jump scares and tricks that you go back to it and you can watch it, you know, multiple times. And I think this is an episode that's geared more in that vein than just a here's some some flash is this the most rewatchable episode of the the series so far um i i think it's the episode with the most amount of depth to it i don't know if i i I think they're still and i I don't remember the names as much but the two that rookies is really good the fight in the snow um trespass Trespass, i still love and then the other one is uh uh ventress trying to bust gunray out of the uh the prison ship um, I think those ones are, are rewatchable as well. So those are kind of my my four that... Yeah, I think those are... I, I'm trying to remember what that episode was called, because that was... There were some great visuals, and it was just cool to see how scared that Jedi was. Yeah. Um, her name, I'm, I'm forgetting it. Those and I believe that was... Was that also... No, that wasn't the one where R2 got in a fight. <laughs> that was a different no, that one. Is, <laughs> that was an awesome one. Battle of the Droids. <laughs> yeah. Duel of the Droids. That's right. All right, so we both like this one. We are hurtling quickly towards the end of the season. I think what I'm going to do at the end of this season is I'm going to put season one to the side, re-rank the episodes of season two, and at the end of season two, I'll see which one I like better, season one or season two. That's my I think you have plan. to, because you can't yeah. have a list of 60 episodes. <sighs> oh, I could. Be, well, you could, yeah. Come on, it's me. Yeah, get a spreadsheet. I could do that. And, yeah. And put it down, but but yeah. I'm not going to just so it's cleaner that way. So yeah, I it set the bar high though. I, with the season getting, you know, we're moving towards the end of this first season. I'm I part of me after this ended went. I don't know if we're going to get a better one than that yeah. the rest of the way this season. What I will say is that most people say that season one is the weakest se- yeah. season. So we got lots of good stuff coming. Hopefully, well, we got them all. So yeah, <laughs> everyone's excited for that. <laughs> I'm not not excited. No, I hear you. It's just. You can talk about preferences. Yeah. Let's get on to other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, what's got you going this week in the news? What other nerd stuff? So, did you ever watch the first Kingsman? Yes. Okay, how did you like that? I liked it. Yeah, I liked it too. I was very surprised because I thought it looked stupid. Right. But I wa- it was on HBO, so I watched it on, on HBO. And recently on HBO... The second Kingsman came out, mm-hmm. and it is horrifically bad. Really? Oh man, what a what a complete disappointment! 
What a complete waste of time. I think I might just watch it the next oh. time just for funsies. Though. But the problem is it's not even like Batman versus Superman, like, you should watch it because it's so bad, bad. It's just kind of a really shoddy, depthless remake of the first one. Really? Like, there's just, it brings nothing new. There's none of the energy. There's none of the fun. Everything seems kind of stale and forced and going through the motions. The CGI is constant and horrific. Mm. Like, you spend most of the movie just being distracted by how bad the, the CGI is. Like, Julianne Moore is bad, which I mm. never really say. Like, this was just a complete, complete waste. And it's a disappointment because, you know, it's Matthew Vaughn. So I, I have relatively high expectations, though part of me was making me retrace what am I putting all those expectations on. I think I'm putting them on two, two and a half movies. Mm-hmm. Because I like... It's the Boyd Holbrook effect? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Because, you know, I, ha- I haven't seen Kick-Ass. Right. Um, Kick-Ass is great. Is it? Yeah, it's okay. great. I haven't seen that. Uh, Kings- Kingsman 2 is awful. Kingsman 1, I'll give the half to. Um, X-Men First Class, I-, I like a lot. And I think Layer Cake is, by leaps and bounds, his best movie. I haven't seen Layer Cake. So, so Layer... Well, I'll make that my recommendation, then, for the week, since I, I gave us something bad instead of something good. Layer Cake is awesome. It's uh, it's a British crime movie. You know, Matthew Vaughn kind of came. He he was a writer, a producer with Guy Ritchie. Mm. So Layer Cake is you could say is his version of a Guy Ritchie movie, but much superior in my opinion. Mm. So it's kind of you know a bunch of interconnecting crime gangs moving in and out with Daniel Craig being the main focal point of it. And most people say that his performance in Layer Cake is what got him Casino Royale. Mm-hmm. because he is fantastic in it and it's got a lot of other people in it as well sienna miller's in it it is a really really fun crime drama so Let me ask you this you talk about guy Ritchie. what's your take on snatch and lock stock and two smoking barrels they're they're the same movie yeah <laughs> okay. and and i saw lock stock first so when i saw that i really really liked it and then when i saw snatch i was disappointed because it's it's beat for beat the same movie like i was i was really disappointed in that but I guarantee you, if I saw them in reverse order, I'd have the same feelings just in reverse about the movies. Yeah. I so, saw Snatch, and I never saw a lot of stuff in these movies. Okay. Basically because I was told, wait, these are the same movies. So nobody likes Snatch who saw the original one. And I'm like, this movie's awesome! Yeah, yeah, that's why. I mean, you know, they obviously they don't have the Brad Pitt factor right. and all that going on. But it's it's the same. It's, it's, it's shocking how similar those mm-hmm. movies are, which is disappointing and i know he's had some real misfires when he tries to go off brand with you know swept away and king arthur and mm. some of these other things i mean i was okay with uh i saw the first sherlock holmes movie and mm. had a fine time with it so he, he can do stuff outside maybe that traditional wheelhouse but man it's he's not someone i'd ever go see something in the theater like it's got a it's got to really pass some tests before sure. I'm going to clank down money for him. Sure. The problem I have now with Sherlock Holmes and that whole IP from the, the film standpoint, I really liked Jude Law in that movie. I thought uh, Robert Downey Jr. did a, a fine job. And then I saw the BBC version of Sherlock yeah. Holmes, and I was like, I haven't thought twice about the Guy Ritchie version since then. Yeah. I mean, they're I mean they're, they're completely different right. in, in every sense of the term. You know, I mean, the Guy Ritchie ones are action movies, and the, the, the BBC shows are more mysteries. And stuff. I mean, the BBC ones are significantly better. I mean, even you know the BBC ones are current time frame and stuff too. the The one thing I did really like in the first Sherlock Holmes was how they would kind of show you his thought process. So he'd be a, you know be about to be in the fight, and they'd show you how the fight went down. But that wasn't actually how the fight went down. That was him processing it in his head so that he could then perfect the fight. So I thought that was kind of a unique and, mm-hmm. and fun thing. So those aren't movies that I would. I haven't seen the second one. I wouldn't tell everyone to drop anything and go see them. But, man, if they're on TV, check them out. There you go. So, tonight we're meeting an hour later than we normally plan to, and that's because you were gracious enough because of my fatigue level. Well, part of the reason that I'm so tired is I've just my, my schedule's all, all wacky, and it got worse last night. Because last night, I couldn't sleep, and I was flipping through Netflix trying to look for something new. And I came across a documentary on George Harrison called Living in the Material World. I've always been a huge Beatles fan. And I figured I'd watch about 20 minutes. And you know how I get at late at night, I watch 20 minutes of something, I'm out. Um, back before you were in love with Jim, you were in love with me. And we had lots of sleepovers. <laughs> so I'm figuring I'll watch 20 minutes of this before I get tired. Uh, but I never got tired. I watched the whole damn thing. And it's like two documentaries put together. Oh, that's awesome. And it takes you through the entirety of Harrison's life interviews of people like Klaus Vermin and Ashley Kirchner from his time in Hamburg, and then Eric Clapton, who stole his wife, 
Um, also, his what, his ex wife. But they had a joke about it too. They what was the what they call themselves like husbands in law, or something like that. And, and and that was one of the interesting things about the documentary is that you thought it was all like ha ha free love and stuff like that. And George Harrison was a lot more hurt by it. when you heard wow. exactly how it went down. Um, you know, I think a lot of that has been put forth by Eric Clapton to make himself sound less of a well, asshole. In Eric Clapton's defense, we got Layla out of it, so. It's completely worth it. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I, I think that song is kind of overrated in my opinion. Oh, I love that song. But I haven't really liked it. I think, the, yeah, I think the Unplugged version is actually overrated. Yeah, well, I would say that for sure. And I'd say I definitely like the electric version better, the original version. Um, but it also, towards the end, had interviews with his son and his second wife, Olivia. And um, so I started listening to a lot of George Harrison's solo stuff. When I was a big Beatle fan... Before, I, I didn't listen to a lot of their solo stuff, with the exception of John Lennon, because Lennon was my favorite. But holy crap, like, hit that album, um, All Things Must Pass, is such, like, an F you to, to Lennon and McCartney for the way that he was treated. And I went back and listened to some of the stuff, like, on the White Album and the lyrics, and he's basically talking about how fed up he is. Like, While, while My Guitar Gently Weeps is not just a story about, like, the world. It's a story about looking at you all, talking about the rest of the Beatles, and he's just sitting there playing his guitar and looking at the floor. And it just, I, it's tough to shock me about stuff with the Beatles because I was such a huge fan, especially in high school, that in seeing this, it just really opened my eyes to his his perspective on things, and it really made me like him a lot more. So I highly recommend it if we have any Beatles fans out there. Do you like the Beatles? And so, who's your who's your guy? I do, and I, this is such a vanilla take, but I, I like Paul McCartney, not as much like the I have nothing against the personality or whatever of Paul McCartney, but I just generally gravitate to the songs mm -hmm. that he made. And my shocking Beatles statement that I will make is that if you if you combine the catalogs, I think that Band on the Run would be a top five song. If you combine them all. Like, I absolutely love Band on the Run. And I'm pretty sure you hate that song. No. Oh, okay. You're wrong. Oh, okay. I love Band on the Run. Okay. I do like Paul McCartney. It's just he was such a dick for the last five years of the Beatles. That well, again, I'm not, I'm not talking play. about personality-wise. Here's what I'll say about how, how much I like Band of Run. There, are, there is a middle part. Like, there's you can break Band, of, uh, Band on the Run into three parts, and the middle part where it's in these minor chords, where we got to get out of here, da 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 that is one of two times in classic rock that I wish there was more of that section. That's my biggest problem with Band on the Run, is that middle part is so short. Similar to, there's a Pink Floyd song, um, I can't remember the name of it, it's off the wall, where there's like a middle bar like that, mm -hmm. where it just, it cuts off so short and wants you more. And this, these, I mean, it's like 30, 40 years that these songs have been out, I've been listening to them my whole life. And I, like every time I listen to it, I think, God damn! I just wish they had just written it like a little bit longer. Do you think sometimes it. they do that intentionally because it makes you re-listen to a song more because you want to go back to that part? Um, considering we're talking about one guy who is one of the greatest songwriters in the history of the world, in Paul McCartney, and the, another guy who I believe wrote "Dark Side of the Moon" along with "The Wizard of Oz" to blow your flipping mind. Yes, I, I live, <laughs> live in a world where I think both of those guys are that freaking good. Roger Waters is that good, and Paul McCartney is that good. I'd like to think that. Yeah, no, I I I like the Beatles. That was my parents did not listen to to music very often. Uh, when we were driving around in the car, they listened to to news talk radio. Uh, the one tape that my dad had, the only musical tape that he had, and the only band he listened to was The Greatest Hits of Peter, Paul, and Mary, okay, okay, which was yeah. horrific how many times <laughs> I've heard that. But my mom grew up, you know, she was one of those kids who had posters on her wall and watched The Ed Sullivan Show and, and all those things. And then when we got a CD player, she went and bought, you know, like, like a four-disc set that was the, the Beatles stuff. So I know a lot of the songs and like a lot of the songs, but I can't say I have delved too much into the history of them as people mm -hmm. and them interacting and how and why the band broke up. Um, I, I don't know why. It's just never been something that I've I've really leaped at. Um and, and, I mean, the, the most things I honestly know is just about um, how, what a horrible guy John Lennon was to his first wife. So. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. the rest of his bandmates. Yeah. And pretty much everybody, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is going to shock you, but I was really, really into it where I read, like, I think oh. 12 books throughout the course of high school. Like, I was sort of obsessed with the Beatles, just because I love the music and I, and I love learning about the stories behind things and love, like, sort of sure. the deep dive. Um but this brings up a, a question that I have to know the answer to, and maybe not in this episode, but maybe as we go forth, even more important than who your favorite Beatle is, 
Who was your mom's favorite Beatle? Oh, it was also Paul McGarry. Was it? Yeah, okay. he was a cute one, I yeah. think. So, so, and and if you know me, it's probably not surprising that my opinion fell in line with Close my mom. mom's opinion. Your mom's pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> so. I like her. But yeah, I mean, we listen. I listened to. I didn't listen to a ton of what would have been considered at that time classic rock. I suppose now the music I listen to is considered classic rock. Um, but it would be more, it'd be lots and lots of Tom Petty mm. is what I would have listened to in that vein. And then Jimi Hendrix. Okay. Those were kind of a, two especially guys, Tom Petty where that was what I would listen to that wasn't current at the time. Two guys also good friends with George Harrison. Oh one yeah. Of which in the Traveling Wilburys, Tom Petty was in the Traveling Bur- Wilburys. Oh yeah. Oh. I've, uh, I've seen him play Traveling Wilbury songs. Uh, Cause he would play him live in all his shows. That's the greatest live act I've ever seen is, is Tom Petty. I saw him four times and man, he would, he played every song. Like it was the, the, the last song in the fifth encore and stuff. And you could just tell how excited he got to play Wilbury stuff. Yeah. Cause he'd always be like, I'm going to play Wilbury stuff. And he'd like, Interesting thing to see if anybody wants to watch this documentary about living in the material world. Roy Orbison dies and Tom Petty finds out. And he said a couple minutes later, Harrison calls him. And he had talked a little bit about how Harrison always said the right thing at the right time. And he said there was some this, some silence. And then Harrison asked him, aren't you glad it's not you? And it kind of <laughs> took a while. He said he didn't know if he should say that. And, you know, Petty talked. He's like, yeah, you know, like it makes you feel happiness to be alive. And he said, just so you know, Orbison's, or he said, I think he said, oh, he's going to be all right. He'll be fine. It's all going to be fine. And that helped Tom Petty like get through it. So nice. With that, speaking of getting through it, we've now gotten through this episode. Luke, where can they find you? Um, at Luke underscore Nitzo, N E I T Z E O. Excellent. I'm at Miami Madrid. We are at Kid Seriously, and we are out of here. Have a great night, great afternoon, or great whatever time it is, whenever you're listening to this. Hi, Jim. Thanks for listening to Kid Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.